So now we're at rebirth. And rebirth begins by my going to my daughter's house, which was a safe harbor. She and her father and her, my daughter's husband all lived together in this beautiful uh, estate that I once had as a retreat center. And so there I was in my own retreat center in a room that I had wallpapered, and I was the retreatant. <laughs> and this was great. Uh, so that was the beginning. And this was so important because as a child at five, when I was traumatized by my father, when he was an alcoholic, uh, I had put on some armor. And I decided I needed to handle everything in life all by myself, that there was no help available outside for me. And so coming to the end of myself where I could not take care of myself and coming to my daughters, finding that family would, even though they were stressed and had their own difficulties, would set aside uh, time and so forth to be with me, to care for me. And I felt loved and supported and didn't have anything to offer back. And that experience broke the armor that I had had for so many years. While I was at my daughter, she said, you know, Mom, Lee, that was my partner, told me when we were working in the yard one day that he would never put anyone through what he went through when his wife died of cancer. And my daughter said to me, I'm sure that's why Lee broke off the relationship, so that it would not put you through his dying process. And that healed a great rift in my heart. And I was able to let that go and to feel love again for Lee. Then synchronicities began happening all over the place. While I was in bed, I was just on the internet, and I ran across the advanced reading group, the Carl Jung Advanced Reading Group, by guess who? Skip Conover. But I couldn't join the reading group without a computer, and my computer was old and was a PC that sat, you know, that had the big tower and all of that, very old, t old uh, computer. And so within 24 hours or 48 hours, in walks my son with a laptop under his arm, and he's telling he's wanting to sell this. And I said, well, can I buy it? And so there was the computer ready to go. So I immediately joined the advanced reading group. And we can go to image number five. So the advanced reading group was studying this book, Mysterium Conjunctionis, by C.G. Jung, and I had never heard of this particular volume. I'd read a lot of Jung and practiced dream work and so forth over the years, but this was a new offering to me. And what the writings we were studying began to do was to expose the distorted mirrors that trauma had caused in my life. All my life-denying attitudes came into focus, from trauma of my childhood and my experience with God combined with the openness I had made it possible for these writings of Jung to go right to my heart and to like a key unlock a door and uh, open me to health again. The first line that really caught me in this this was so interesting to me because it was like the Bible verses would catch me. Well, here was Mysterium Conjunctionis catching me. And in his paragraph 201, it says, So long as he knows that he is the carrier of life, and it is therefore important for him to live, then the mystery of his soul lives also. But if he no longer sees the meaning of his life in its fulfillment, and no longer believes in his eternal right to this fulfillment, then he has betrayed and lost his soul, substituting for it a madness which leads to destruction. And when I read that, I knew that all the difficulties I'd been through had brought me to this place where I no longer 
saw fulfillment in my life. I no longer really had hope. I was living in the present moment. I was my heart open to God, but I had lost the will to live in good part. And what surprised me was that when CFIDS first appeared, the chronic fatigue syndrome first appeared in the 90s, that I had had meaning with that illness. I had not gone into despair. And it had been that phrase from monasticism, stay in your cell and your cell will teach you everything. And I had lost that meaning that within the suffering, God would be perfecting me and bringing me to the life that I was meant to have. So when I read that in Young, immediately there was a switch with inside me, and I began to open up to life again. That's very exciting, Nancy. I'm glad I turned it back to you to get your full excitement about what you were talking about, paragraph 201. It it really expresses how someone's life can be changed just by something as simple as that. Yes, it's so uh, true. I'm thrilled to have that. Then one day Skip was talking on the Carl Jung Depp Psychology Reading Group about Map of the Soul, Marie Stein's Map of the Soul. We could go to image six. Skip was talking about BTS, and I'd like him to tell us a little bit about BTS when I finish this. And they had just come out with a new album, Map of the Soul Persona. And I thought, you know, I've got that book, Map of the Soul. I'm going to pull it out. And so I went and pulled it out. And what was in that book was some notes I had taken from a Marion Woodman book. And I'll tell you about that after Skip talks a little bit about BTS. Wow, that's uh, very exciting. It's amazing how these things can change people's lives, right? Yes, that's right. BTS is a so-called K-pop group. It's a Korean pop group. And you would never expect such a group to become very popular in the United States. But... Somehow it has, and it's got a worldwide following now. And it's, it's a so-called boy band with seven members in it. And they are very good dancers, and they have terrific choreographers. And the producer of BTS, and I'm, I'm told that BTS is called, is short for behind the scenes. And what they talk about often is mental health, which is something that's not talked about very much in general, you know, pop, certainly not in pop culture. This is the only place that I know of. And as of April, they had over 80 million followers around the world. And people, Americans kept trying to write them off saying, oh, well, this is a boy band. It's just for little girls 13 to 15 years old. And then there's many people around the world, including me, popping up and saying, no, there are a lot of us out here. We really like this. And uh, it's, it's really needed. And I've been long wondering how we could educate young people to psychological issues because it's obvious that we're never going to get public education to do it or not for a very long time because there's so much push and shove from religious groups and so on. And so here's BTS coming along with pop music and they're just going around everything and they're talking about mental health issues. What really floored me in April, they were talking about Dr. Mary Stein's book, Jung's Map of the Soul, An Introduction. And indeed, they named their latest album, which was published on April 12th, 2019, Map of the Soul Persona. And the videography that they have put with that album is just remarkable. It's filled with Jungian archetype and really shows people what persona means in the Jungian sense. 
And so it, they've really gotten the attention of people who are interested in Dr. Young's work. And so I got very excited about it and I started to promote their work. And we started talking about Dr. Stein's book also. And so this must be what you're referring to. But anyway, that's it's, right. Yeah. So that's anyway, when, that's when I went, <laughs> that's when I went and got, pulled out that book. Right. And, and uh, uh, so the next slide, we can go to the next slide, number seven. And the okay. notes inside, this next slide is uh, Addicted to Perfection by Marion Woodman. I'm, uh, I'm going to read the notes I took that I pulled out of Map of the Soul just because Skip was talking about a boy band. I had thoughts going through my mind in this breakdown that were very much like these thoughts, and Marion Woodman calls this Medusa. And these, this is the way someone would think if Medusa was controlling them. And these uh, writings are especially for people who have an eating disorder. So under Medusa, what you would be thinking and feeling would be this. I'm exhausted. I'm ravaged by all these people around me. I'm hungry. I can't hold myself together. I need food. There's no love in my life. I'm not lovable. It's not my fault. I need sweets. I've got to have sweets. I won't be deprived of everything, but I can't help it. It's not my fault. I can't deal with it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And then the great mother, if you were in the influ under the influence of the great mother, this is what you would be thinking and, and saying to yourself. I am tired. I love myself. I love my body. I give myself permission to be nourished. I love my inner woman. What food would be best for her? Is it food I really want? Is it music? Is it dancing? Yes, I am fat, but I'm trying to release my true feminine body, whatever shape it is. What is reality here? This is happening to me. I need to relax. To be quiet, I need a bath. I want to affirm my own life. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Well, when I read those two, converse, those two uh, conversations there, I knew I was under the control of Medusa because I was saying to myself, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I'm exhausted, and so on and so on. And just reading those two and comparing them and seeing myself mirrored as under the influence of Medusa just was like an electric charge. And I began to say to myself the words that, that would be under the influence of the Great Mother. So whenever I noticed I was despairing, I was wanting to go towards being an invalid and so forth, then I would change my inner talk to a much more positive talk. I am experiencing a breakdown. I am in counseling. My doctor is helping me. I met my daughters, and I'm being cared for in love. And when I would go to that kind of thinking, then life would begin, begin to flow into me. Do you want to say yeah. something? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> All I can say is wow, because that's amazing. That's exactly what happened to me yesterday, believe it or not, because I was at the end of the day, I'd been listening to the television testimony all day, and I was just at wit's end about that. And I, would, I had some work to do with one of our friends, Tim Holmes, and just when I wanted to get to my work, Debbie said, well, I have to go to the grocery store with mom, and then I have to go out right after that. I said, okay, I'll go to the grocery store. I'll take your mom to the grocery store and the drugstore. But I just was feeling put upon because I'd, I'd been watching this testimony all day, and then I have to 
spend an hour and a half taking my mother-in-law to the drugstore and the food store. So what, while she was at the drugstore, I went in the liquor store and I bought uh, two bo boxes of wine and an eight pack of harp, which is uh, ale. And then I went in the grocery store and bought boxes of truffles and cookies. So I know exactly <laughs> what this feeling is. <laughs> and I, I didn't come home and drown my sorrows, though. I came home and had one heart. But, and it w I was due to get some wine anyway. But, you know, I just I felt overwhelmed as this was happening. And so, you know, there I am, and I spent $50 in the liquor store, <laughs> another 30 <laughs> at the grocery store just on chocolate. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it is so easy for us to slip into that. And Absolutely. I didn't realize until uh, I read those words from Marion Woodman's book, how important it is, how, how we need to move in that as much as we possibly can, 24-7, you know. Right. Uh, I, I remember listening to an audio tape of Marion Woodman, and she's talking about exactly this point, and she says, I'm trying to keep myself away from the refrigerator and gorging on something, or you're gorging on chocolate pudding or something. And my psyche says, but I want it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just remember the way she put it. Exactly. That yeah. is exactly right. Yeah. And so if we can start with smaller things like your situation, yet was it yesterday? Yes, yesterday. Uh, and work with that and catch ourselves when we're going to that place of self-pity, I guess you would call it, uh, and shift our thinking knowing that we're going towards life when we do. Yeah. That, of and course start I, with something small. I was in a breakdown <laughs> when yeah. I started. But, well, I was uh, in a mini breakdown. But, <laughs> <we're> <laughs> but I, actually, when I was in the liquor store, I knew that this was happening to me. <laughs> I said, well, what the heck? I'm going to go ahead and, and get <laughs> that's the wine. True. We, that's true. We are so human, you know. Yeah. This is our humanity. But and I haven't. We live with it. In fairness, though, I came home and I haven't eaten all the truffles. <laughs> 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 Good for I you. Did, <laughs> because I did know that this was happening to me, but anyway. Here comes another synchronicity. I'm on the in the advanced reading group. We have a Zoom meeting, so we get to see each other. And I am in bed at my daughter's in the advanced reading group. And I must have said something to trigger Skip's imagination, because towards the end of the meeting, he said, if any of you are going through a tough time, give me a call, and he gave us his phone number. So within a day or two, I got my courage up, and I called and left a message. And that led to a conversation that Skip taped, two videos that he has of conversation from bed in a breakdown. And he has those videos on his website or his uh, Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group website, and the names of those two videos, the first one is, Does the Bridge to God Have to be Built? And the other one is, Once You've Had Experience, You Know. So if you're interested in that period and what was going on in me during the breakdown, you can see it. I will put a link to those two videos okay. under this uh, video so that okay. people can find them. All right. Shall I just go ahead then? Yes. Okay. So in, the, in, I think it was the very first conversation, one of the things Skip asked me was, what did I believe about the devil? Well, I hadn't been asked that question, I don't think, ever in my life, and I had not thought about the devil in years. So I kind of brushed it off with a, uh, quoting of a scripture that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and we went on from there. But it kept gnawing at me. That question kept gnawing at me. 
And I realized that I really didn't know much about evil. And in Mysterium Conjunctionis, paragraph 206, I read this. Even a life dedicated to God is still lived by an ego, which speaks of an ego and asserts an ego in God's despite, which does not instantly merge itself with God, but reserves for itself a freedom and a will, which it sets up outside of God and against God, only through self-assertion, which is as sure of its free will as Lucifer, what Adam and Eve did. So when I read that, I thought, well, Nancy, you have reserved a good part of your life outside <laughs> of God. And that's what the devil did. And so you are just like the devil in that regard. And so it was like a curtain drew apart and I saw my own evil. Oh, wow. And this was, this was a great breakthrough, uh, not happy breakthrough, but happy later breakthrough to actually connect evil in myself, that it actually was there, and it was there in a way I could recognize and could not wiggle out of. And uh, this really helped me a great deal because when I could accept that this was true about me, then when my daughter came in one day and sat on the bed to talk to me about something that was bothering her about me that I was doing in her house, I didn't go into shame. I went into the acceptance of myself as having evil in me and deserving to be corrected, deserving to be put in my place. And she could feel the difference. And I talked to her a little bit about what was going on, and she said, Mom, I think what happened is, when I used to try to talk to you, I bumped into shame and you brushed me back. But now I can really talk to you. And I said, well, tell your brother, too, <laughs> that he, has some stuff he needs to talk about, that this would be a good time. And so both my adult children began to talk to me about things that I had done along the way in their life that had been hurtful to them. And I did not go into shame. I did not go into embarrassment. I went into that place of acceptance of my own evil and deserving of their rebuke. And I was able to receive it and extend love to them as they did it. So it was a tremendous breakthrough for our family and continues to be. Wow, that's terrific. I, I just, um, I, I remember you mentioning something about that a couple of months back, but I didn't have the full context of it until now. So that's, yeah. that's very powerful. And of course, you know why I asked you that question, right? Yes, yes, because, uh, well, go, why don't you say why? Well, I asked you the question because I have run into the devil myself. And I mean a real vision of the devil. And it happened, well, the, the long story is that I had left the mother of my three daughters. And I did that when my second daughter was 10 years old. And so 12 years later, she had finished college. She'd been to Russia. And while she was in Russia, she fell in with American missionaries who are fundamentalists. And so when she came back, I was very happy to see her back. And we had had lots of adventures when she was a little girl because five years of her first 10 years were spent in Japan and her little sister was born in Japan and we had traveled all around the world and so on. And now she had traveled on her own to Russia and she was back in the Washington area working for the American Red Cross. And it happened to be her 22nd birthday. So I said, you know, why don't I take you out to dinner for your birthday? Because she didn't have anything special to do. 
So I took her to this lovely Afghan restaurant in downtown Washington. And we had a really beautiful evening together for three hours. And at the end of it, just as we're parting, we're, I literally had my car door open and we're saying goodbye. And she says, well, Dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I'm, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think you're going to hell quote, unquote. Hmm. And I go, Oh, my God, you know, and it was it was just like a kick in the head, honestly. <laughs> and so, so I was literally and then she left. And so so she left. And so there I am reeling over this comment, I think you're going to hell. And I think to myself, my God, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? And so I was really steaming and cooking about that. And I started driving back across from Washington to Annapolis, which was a 35-mile trip. And about halfway across on Route 50, going about 65 miles an hour, Suddenly, I had a vision of Mephistopheles sitting next to me. I mean, literally, the Mephistopheles that I had imagined at the time I read Faustus. Mm. And, and so these things always come from your unconscious. So they're images that you already have in you. And so that was the image that came up because that was an image of the devil that I had, which was the devil from... Uh, Faustus. And so he plopped down in the seat next to me, and I was stunned, and I didn't know what to do, but I said, said to myself, okay, I'll make the deal with the devil. So I said, you can have my immortal soul on my death on condition that none of my daughters ever believe that about me for the rest of my life. And he disappeared. And so then that got me thinking, obviously. I mean, I, you know, I've been criticized for making such a cheap deal with the devil, but on the other hand, on the other hand, when you're going 65 miles an hour down a superhighway and suddenly you have the devil sitting next to you, um, you better think fast. And it worked. And 20, you know, now it's now 21 years ago that this happened and he hasn't been back. So it seems that it worked. And, but meanwhile, then obviously having such a tremendous image come to me, uh, it, you know, I was already well in my study of Jungian psychology. So I knew that it was a uh, emanation from my deep unconscious that had been there. But, you know, most people wouldn't know that if they had a vision of the devil, they wouldn't know what that was. And they, yeah. you know, and so somebody could easily have a accident, you know, in a situation like that. But fortunately, I did know what it was. But then it really made me want to study Jungian psychology quite a bit more in detail, and that was in 1998, 19, I'm sorry, that was in 1999 that that happened, mm -hmm. so it was 20 years ago, and... Um, well, we're sitting here today because of that. Yeah, definitely, sure. And talking about it. Yep, that's right, yeah. that's right, and, and, you know, and that incident had this influence on him years of my conversation yes. such that it had all those influences that on your family yes. and so but know. one of the things i i believe today is that if we really want to love we need to accept our own evil because if yes. we don't we project it onto other people yes but if we own our own evil and it may take maturity to get there uh, but if we are able to own our own evil then we meet the other person accepting that they have an evil side as well but we're going to love them as a uh, flawed human being you might say as an ordinary human being right. uh, and not project our 
evil onto them. Right. So and we it, could, oh, did well, you want to say? Yeah, and just in fairness toward my daughter, uh, since this is going to be public, <laughs> 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 just in fairness to my daughter, since this is going to be a public interview, we never had another incident like that after that. So Mephistopheles was good to his word, and I've respected her religious feelings and and do respect them even today. And that has been made possible by my study of Jungian psychology. And indeed, I've gotten to be more respectful of Christianity since I've been studying Jungian psychology, because now I understand things about it that I never would have understood before. And I was able to give that lecture, Finding the Living God, recently uh, about what I've learned. And, you know, at, at that time in 1999, in February of 1999, um, I was furious. I mean, I, if, if a fundamentalist had come across my path at that time, I, I was feeling murderous about it because of what it had brought up between my daughter and me. And, uh, you know, and still to this day, I say, you know, to, you know, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? That's ridiculous. But, you know, I had to go through my studies another, probably another decade before I came around to reconciling myself with Christianity. And, you know, now I've come to the point where I can feel confident of dealing with someone like Paul Vanderclay, who's a very knowledgeable theologian, and actually helping him understand what his profession is. Because when he and I talked at one point, he was not had not really been conscious of the fact that he was in the same line of work as psychologists, that theologians and psychologists are really in the same line of work, and he was not. And so the fact that I was pushed into my studies because of this, you know, has led to all of this for what it's worth. <laughs>